Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture, chapter 9, part 1, types of joints. So there are three main structural categories for the different joints of the body. The first category is fibrous joints. In these joints, bones are connected by dense, irregular connective tissue and usually undergo little to no movement. Second category is cartilaginous joints. And here the joints are connected by hyaline cartilage, or fibrocartilage. And again, these bones in these joints do not move or only move a little bit. And the third category is synovial joints. These are the joints that are the most movable and are pretty much the most common joints found in our body. These joints have a joint cavity, which is formed by tough connective tissue capsule. And inside that cavity holds synovial fluid and other components that we'll be going into. Fibrous joints. One type of fibrous joints are the sutures found in the skull. And these are immovable joints formed by the skull bones and connected by fibrous tissue, again by the irregular dense connective tissue. And you'd expect little to no movement, at least that's the goal. The second type of fibrous joints is syndesmosis, which are found in places like the anterior tibiofibular ligament at the distal end of the tibia and fibula and here you see very little movement. It's also found in the um, periodontal ligament, which connects the tooth to the socket of the alveolar process. And even though technically the tooth is not considered a bone, this is still considered a joint. And in all, both cases, you expect little to no movement. And then the interosseous membranes. These are sheets that go between certain bones, such as the fibula and tibia, or the ulna and radius. And again, you expect a little bit of movement, a little bit of twisting, but not much. Then there's the cartilaginous joints. Here, again, you do not expect to see much movement between the bones. One example is the synchrondrosis. This is hyaline cartilage that unites either the first rib to the sternum, as seen here, so there'd be two spots where that occurs. Or it is in the diaphysis and the epiphysis. So it's where the ephesial growth plate is. And so this would only exist in people whose long bones are still growing in length, such as children. And then there's the synthesis, which is a fibrocartilage that is found in sort of a disc shape, either in the pubic synthesis between the two hip bones or between the vertebrae as intervertebral discs. Now I move on to synovial joints. Again, these are the most movable joints. Pretty much when we think of a joint, we're actually thinking of a type of synovial joint. And one of the many features of a synovial joint is the articulating cartilage, which is made of hyaline. Now this cartilage lies at the ends of every bone that's going to be articulating to form a synovial joint. And its goal is to help reduce friction, because again, friction is the enemy of our body, and also to help absorb some shot, uh, shock. And it is somewhat continuous with the uh, periosteum. Uh, also found in synovial joints is the articular capsule. And this is what actually ends up forming the synovial cavity, or the space that's going to be filled with fluid. And this has two layers. It has the outer fibrous membrane, which is basically a ligament because it's going from one bone to another, and then the inner synovial membrane that helps provide the fluids for the synovial uh, joint. And it forms with the articular, articulate cartilage to form this complete capsule structure. So again, the capsule is formed of the articular capsule and the articular cartilage to form that cavity. And then within the cavity is the synovial fluid, which is a viscous liquid that, again, reduces friction here by lubricating the joints and also helps absorb shocks. And then there are usually various accessory structures found in synovial joints, such as ligaments, discs, slabra. And for instance, uh, here you see uh, ligaments. Now, ligaments can be found inside the cavity itself or outside of the uh, articular capsule. So in this example, you can see the um, ACL. That would be inside the cavity. 
while you also have the uh, lateral co lateral ligament, also known as the fibular collateral ligament, that is outside of the um, articular capsule. Within the capsule, you can also find discs or partial discs. So these articular discs are made of fibrocartilage, and they help separate it into two parts, and they act as a shock absorber. So a good example of that would be the medial and lateral menisci found in a knee. You also can find a, a labrum. A labrum is basically a cartilaginous lip that goes all the way around the joint, and basically it helps increase the contact. So if you sort of imagine, say, one of those cups with a rubber ring around it, the labrum is basically acting as that rubber ring to help um, make the joint uh, stronger. And so here you can see a picture of, uh, say, two finger bones here. And you can see the articular cartilage running along the ends of the bones. Then you can kind of see the fibrous membrane and the synovial membrane of the articular capsule that's connected to the articular cartilage. So some other structures that can be found in a joint, a synovial joint, includes bursas and tendon sheaths. And these are synovial fluid-filled sacs that, again, are helping reduce friction and possibly uh, providing some cushioning. So in this picture of the uh, shoulder joint, you can see a bursa here, basically a bag filled with synovial fluid, and then a tendon sheath wrapped around this tendon to help protect it from friction from the edge of the humerus bone. So here just gives you an idea of how there are way more synovial joints than fibrous or cartilaginous joints. So let's talk about some of the different types of synovial joints because we have lots of joints and they move in lots of different ways. So first talk about plane joints. Plane joints are basically two flat surfaces that are articulating and this allows for side to side and back to forth motion. And the best examples of these kind of plane joints are in the wrist bones between the carpals, intercarpal, or between the tarsals, intertarsals, and also the vertebral bones shifting with each other, allowing us to, you know, touch our toes and stuff. And so these joints are often considered biaxial or triaxial. And so if you look at the foot, for instance, one kind of movement caused by plane joints is inversion of the foot and eversion of the foot. Second type is the hinge joints. So the best example possible is the elbow. And this only allows movement along one plane. So this is uniaxial. And it basically functions like the hinge on a door. So you can uh, bend your arm toward your shoulder, and that would be flexion. And you can also re-extend your arm, and that would be extension. However, with this kind of joint, you never get hyperextension unless you've hurt yourself. Pivot joints. Pivot joints are, have a rounded end of one bone that fits into another and allows for a rotational type movement. Uh, the best example of this is the pivot joint found between the head of the radius here and the radial notch of the ulna. And this allows for supination and pronation. Then there's condyloid joints. Here you're looking at sort of a ball and cup sort of shape, so the bone shape sort of like a cup, fits onto a ball-shaped bone, and a good example of this is the radius with the scaphoid, or even the ulna with the lunate. And this allows for side-to-side -side and back-to-forth motions, so for exam example, you can, with your hand, do an abduction and an adduction. Saddle joints. Saddle joint is where basically you have two ends that fit. One bone is shaped kind of like a saddle, and the other joint is kind of like the guy's legs who's going to sit on that saddle. And this allows for biaxial motions, and a very good example of this is thumb joint, specifically the uh, metacarpal one moving with against uh, the trapezium bone in the wrist. And this allows for opposition movement of the thumb, which basically allows us to grasp things easily. Next is the ball and socket joints. This is where you have a very large spherical end that's fitting into a round socket, but usually the spherical end is a bit larger than the socket that it's fitting into. And by having this um, 
setup, it allows for movement in multiple planes. So you get triaxial movement at a ball and socket joint, with the two best examples being the hip joint and the shoulder joint. So as you can see here, with a ball and socket type joint, you got both abduction and adduction. You've got flexion, extension, and hyperextension. You've got circumduction, and also lateral and medial rotation of the arm. So a lot of possible movements with a ball and socket joint. And that's it for this part of the lecture.